Okay. Uh, welcome. My name is Maris Kreisman, and I'm so thrilled to welcome you tonight to another excellent virtual event at McNally Jackson. If you go to McNallyJackson.com and look at our events calendar, you'll see all the amazing writers and programs we're hosting in the coming weeks. Please keep an eye on the site or subscribe to our newsletter to hear more about what's coming soon. There will be time at the end of tonight's conversation for your questions, so start thinking about them now. You can use the Zoom chat function to submit any questions you have, and we'll get to them towards the end of the evening. We're so glad that even though we can't all be in the same room at the moment, we're still able to host events during this difficult time. As we've weathered the pandemic and reopened all four of our locations for browsing and shopping, indie bookstores like ours still need more support. And so if you enjoy free events like this one and want us to keep hosting more of them, please buy books from us. Uh, throughout the evening, I'll be posting links in the chat to buy fashion criticism from McNally Jackson. And I'm so excited to celebrate it with you tonight. Um, pleased to introduce Francesca Granada, who is an associate professor of fashion studies at Parsons School of Design. She holds a PhD from Central St. Martin's University of the Arts London and has published widely on 20th century and contemporary fashion and greater visual culture. She's the author of Experimental Fashion and editor of the nonprofit journal Fashion Projects. She lives in New York. And tonight, Francesca is joined by Judith Thurman, who is a staff writer at The New Yorker. She's the author of several books, including Cleopatra's Nose, 39 Varieties of Desire, Secrets of the Flesh, A Life of Colette, and Isaac Dennison, The Life of a Storyteller, which won the National Book Award. She also lives in New York City, and it's a pleasure to have both of you tonight. Good to be here. Thank you so much, Maris and McNally Jackson for hosting um, this event. And um, of course, to Judith Thurman for um, being here with me tonight. She has been such an inspiration for um, this book. Um, and writing really led me to start appreciating the importance of fashion criticism and um, you know, it's um, quality. So I wanted to start by asking Judith, as we have heard, she's had a story, the careers. How did you, you, you came to, to write about fashion a bit later in your career. How did, what drew, drew you to it and how did you come to it? Well, I, I had been contributing to The New Yorker for about um, 15 years uh, when I kind of went back full time. I, I had been, I took time off. I started in the mid eighties and then I took time off to research and write my, the biography of Colette. And then towards the very end of the nineties, 1999, I wanted to go back. I didn't have a book I wanted to do. I wanted to go back and write sort of serious, serious journalism, literary journalism, I thought, because that's what I really do. And I had a meeting with David Remnick and we were old friends. I mean, I knew David, we had both been colleagues on the magazine. He, he, he was just suddenly my boss. So we went out to lunch and he said, oh, great. I can't, you know, come, come work for us, come write for us. What do you want to write about? And I said, oh, you know, I want to write about, do profiles and I want to write about literature. And he said, yeah, 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 well, everybody does that. Um, uh, what else do you want to write about? And uh, I, it just popped into my head, you know, it's sort of the, the um, my, my, I guess my libido spoke. And I said, I would really love to write about fashion in a serious way. I don't think, I was great friend and, and still am of Holly Rubach and she had gone on, she left the magazine and gone on to other things. She was at the time, she was a designer, of, you know, she did a whole bunch of other things besides fashion criticism. Um, but I had loved her work. I knew Kennedy Fraser. I loved her work. I had read Lois Long and Elizabeth Hawes. So I felt that there was a there was a really uh, vi pretty vibrant and and uh, admirable tradition of fashion writing at the magazine. So that's how I started. That's I David said, great, you know, go go do it. And yeah, yeah, it's really interesting. They're all in the book. Those people you mentioned, but. Um, Fashion critic, some fashion critic have mentioned that they were somewhat um, anxious entering the field, thinking um, that it might uh, 
be seen as diminishing their work. I mean, by the time you started writing about fashion, you had a national book award. Were you nervous that this association with fashion might devalue your work? Or your I, wanted, I, I actually, as a feminist, I wanted to take that on. Okay. It was like, come and get me. I'm gonna sit, I'm gonna sit here. Uh, if you don't like it, you know, let's talk about it. Um, because yes, it's absolutely true. And there were some, um, there were some uh, people, intellectuals, even friends who, who I could tell were thought that it was a little of a come down. It was demeaning to go from, to, to go to writing about clothes, right? That's what one of the things that you're doing in this book that's so important uh, is um, it's, it's not a quote woman's page subject. It, it, you know, it has been, it has been uh, cornered, it's been um, channeled, it's been put in a lane in a silo. Uh, but I, I actually wanted to, I, that was sort of a goal is to, uh, to pry it out of there. Yeah, yeah, as you were saying, the book, part of the, you know, it looks at it historical and how it has been um, kind of dismissed as the, this woman subject because it was it was housed in the newspaper in the women's pages, which were interestingly, you know, considered the epitome of, of soft news. And they covered the four Fs. I love the expression. So they covered food, fashion, family, and furnishing. So they oh. were like seen as like yeah. <laughs> the end of the four Fs um, club, right? That's very yeah. Funny. Four Fs. Uh, no, but, I, I felt I felt that also that that, that David and my other editors there, uh, Susan Morrison and Dorothy Wickenden and and the the, the, the people who I worked with, you know, uh, Sharon Delano in Virginia, Cannon and now Nick Troutwine, that they were all um, very open to uh, treating this as any other New Yorker subject. Yeah, and so they 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 have been. And I was curious on a more personal note, what your relation to fashion had been up to that point, or even it is now, like you wrote about fashion being like this language having to do, to do with identity. I was curious how much your identity was formed through fashion. Yeah, um, well, that's a very good question. Of course, it's a long story. I, I, I grew up in Queens in a working class, lower middle class, garden apartment development that was built in 1950 and um and my parents who i don't know they, they sort of washed up there frankly they were they, had, they were educated people and great readers but they they just sort of were there and so it was it was as far away even though it was you know uh 25 minutes on the double r train in those days it was a double r it might as well have been you know podunk it might as well have been ulan bator you know in terms of its distance from the, the fashionable, the glamorous and fashionable world. And I, I, I remember, I think the, the, the moment in which I became aware of fashion was something really interesting was Grace Kelly's wedding, which I think was, I don't know what year it was, but I was a little girl. I, I, was, I, I was, of course, alive, but um, I was a little girl and I was just, you know, there was all of this stuff about the dress and the this and the that. And, the, and I think Grace Kelly's wedding dress was the, my, you know, the, the point of contact for me and then as the years went by and I, I, you know, I went to, I lived in Europe for a long time. I, I learned languages and I lived in Europe and I had, um, you know, foreign boyfriends whose mothers were incredibly chic. And uh, so I, it was, it was one of the, the four languages though. It was one of the foreign languages that I acquired in my, my twenties. Uh, and, and it was like the others. I, I speak it pretty fluently, but not perfectly. And there's still a little accent there from Queens, you know. Uh, um, I'm wearing my pajama bottoms under my Comme des Garçons top, you know, so. Um. That's funny. And it's so interesting you mentioned Comme des Garçons because uh, one of the, your pieces in the book, and it's one of my favorite pieces, is um, your profile of Ray Kawakubo, the designer of Comme des Garçons. And she's notoriously, famously very reticent, right? Right. And um, the profile is so intriguing, but so detailed, and you got to interview her. And I was curious, how did you, how did you manage to get to her? Well, I got to her really through her husband, Adrian Jaffe, okay. uh, who's a wonderful. Um, uh, we had we we struck up a rapport. They 
they're very intellectuals. Ray knew of the magazine. She might have read some of my other pieces. And so she, whether she says anything or not, she lets it be known that this is a good idea and she wants to participate. And then Adrian and I spent a lot of time together. I went to, we went on a little trip to Berlin together where I had never been to see a Cambiasong pop-up store. And we, so we had this friendship. Then I went to the shows. I went to the, the, the showroom in Paris. I went, I went to Tokyo to, uh, I went to Tokyo and, um, and to the, the headquarters. And I interviewed um, all of her long, long time, uh, you know, firsthand people. And Adrian was my interpreter. His, he's completely fluent in, in Japanese. And so it was a very strange, it was a triangulated relationship because he was interpreting for Ray and I don't know if he was interpreting everything, you know, I'll never know. And, and, I, I, and so I have also made a specialty, this came in handy uh, in my, my career of difficult women. I sort of like it. Oh. And, um, and it's a challenge, you know, it's a challenge. And it wasn't, I don't approach it aggressively. It's not a, it's not like a, a challenge that I want to dominate them or make them say things that they don't want to say. But the challenge is, is finding a mode of relationship of finding an irony of finding a complicity of finding a way in. And with Ray, that's very hard, but, um, but you pay, you, you, you try to attune yourself to somebody and, uh, and she's incredibly ironic. So mm -hmm. I, I, I was just, you know, it's sort of like, I guess it's a bit like surfing. You you ride the wave of the conversation, and at the end of one long conversation, which she said very little, um, she said uh, uh, that she was very glad that I hadn't asked her about her work <laughs> or how she worked with it. So I, I don't know. So uh, some of her reticence was met with some of my detachment, and and it worked out. And of course, Tokyo and. Uh, wandering around Tokyo and, and I knew where her apartment building was, but of course she didn't invite anybody up there. And um, so it was also trying to get, to go around, to do, to, to, to make a circle around and, and find rich things for the piece. Yeah. And in that piece, but also in other pieces you have done, you, you really spoke beautiful about the clothing and the detail of the garments and the designs, um, the potter and the potter makers. How did you, how are you able to do that? I mean, you're not trained as a designer, of course. No. Uh, how are you exposed to it? How did you get to? Well, you know, when you write nonfiction, you listen to stories very attentively. And uh, I'm thinking of my friend, Philip Roth, who died, sadly, in 2018. And the way he went about his fiction, he was a great model in that respect. If he was going to write about a glove maker, mm -hmm what he would write about glove making had to be absolutely accurate. And he, he talked to an old glove maker and he took very copious notes and he would go back and ask questions. And so if you don't know somebody, that's how you have to, you talk to experts and you make sure that they explain it. To you. you make sure that you understand what they're telling you. Uh, and I know some, you know, a little bit about, not very much it's true, but I know enough to, to, uh, to sort of uh, fake it a little bit with you know sewing sewing terms and and this and that uh, and um, and they were very they were very helpful. People want to show you their work. They want to explain how they do it. They're very happy to do that. It's really interesting. And another thing, talking about your nonfiction work, um, your book about collect and like your interest in, of course, sexuality, um, writing about gender and sexuality and. Did you see a connection between that work you were doing and then subsequently you writing about fashion? Absolutely. It, it's it's the same, it's a you know, it's a it's the same bolt of cloth, really. Uh, it, you know, sexual identity, gender, um, who we are as women. I, I I wrote one piece on menswear, which was fun, and I it was a, it was an interesting piece, but mostly of course I'm writing about women's fashion. Now, of course, it's different. Now, of course, there's fashions changed so much. I, I haven't written about it much. I have a piece coming out in the style issue, but I haven't been writing about it in the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. But um, but it's really about it's it is a woman subject. It has been a woman subject in a certain way. And so the relationship of the body of sense of self, it's about identity. And that has been my subject as a biographer. Uh, and and, you know, how do you become a person and a woman? 
And I think that clothes are a very important part of that expression, um, how we express ourselves and how we see ourselves, how we don't see ourselves, how we don't, do not see ourselves, how we are not mirrored and how we are mirrored. So all of that is very relevant. Yeah. And I remember you mentioning at some point that there was something specifically American about these a slightly American things about a puritanical vibe to this initial resistance to fashion and fashion criticism has been taken seriously um, because of its connection with sexuality. Um, that's one it, it, there's always been a puritanical, um, well, it's a misogynistic, it's been a misogynistic thing. There've been men, and some of them are in the anthology who've written, uh, written, written, of course, wonderfully about fashion, but, um, it's, uh, you know, it, 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 it's part of the old notion that women can't think seriously, you know, that this is, that they're frivolous. It's oh. been hard with frivolity as a subject. Yeah, um, and of course that is not the case. I was wanted to also ask you a little bit about your writing on the other piece in the book, it's your review on the Alexander McQueen show at the Mats at the Costume Institute. Um, and she's, of course, beautifully written. And I was curious, again, how did you approach writing about exhibition? And just more generally, your what do you make about this huge popularity in fashion exhibition in the last 20 years? Well, you know, it's a killer because you have such a tight deadline. It, it, you can't get to see it. You know, you can maybe get in when they're installing it and get a, get a general idea of the show. But generally, you're going to see it a, a day or two beforehand, and then you have to turn in a 3,000 word piece, beautifully written 3,000 word piece. It's one of the most harrowing aspects of what I was doing uh, in, in the years that I was doing that so regularly. Sure. Uh, and the McQueen piece, so um, I, I, I've had nightmares. I've had you know nightmares of writer's block with something that had to be turned in the next morning. And um, uh, that I had that, uh, there was, a, there was another piece I met years ago um, about what was it called? The extreme, it was called extreme fashion. I remember having to go take a hot bath and, and calling my editor and saying, I, I can't, I can't do it. I'm, I don't have any ideas. So in the queen piece in the pressure, you know, under the, the, in the pressure cooker of the moment, I loved the, I loved the queen. I thought he was a genius. And somehow the tragedy of his suicide also increased the intensity of the experience of seeing the show. And I think in that, in that pressure cooker of intensity, the piece just sort of came to me. Um, and, um, uh, and, and also the history of, of, of the Scottish Highlands and all that. There were, it was such a rich show. It was just such a rich show. And it was such a beautiful show. It's an exceptional sure. beautiful show. Yeah. And going back to your profiles, was the one you were talking another time about the one you do well paid they're like really heavily researched right you actually get to see the garments um i mean the process is not that unlike that of an academic like um, you get to you got to go to collection to see the kawakubo show kawakubo clothes i'm sorry so can you speak a little bit about how you came to that method it's it's reporting it's just good reporting you 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 go it's field work you know when i when i uh I've written about some of the great the, the great designers and French designers of the 20s and so forth. And I've gone to the Costume Institute. I have a good relationship with them. I, they do a wonderful job. And I look at, I wanna see how the clothes are made. I, they put on the gloves and they, they turn them inside out and, and, uh, um, and we look at them. And I, I, for this piece that I've just done, we couldn't do that, but I did it via Zoom with one of the curators to see how, oh. to, and, it, and I missed being able to be that intimacy with the fabric, that intimacy with the structure, it's like looking at a painting online. It's just not the same experience. So, uh, you know, there's something about the living cloth. There's something about the actual colors. There's something about being able to see something in three dimensions. It's important for fashion writing. Oh, and just how do you get to your subject? Like, how do you choose your subject? Of course, you don't write just exclusive about fashion, um, but when it well, it, it, the fashion subjects have almost always been, have what we call a hook. It's usually a show or it's a film or it's a death or it's, uh, you know, it's some sort of special occasion 
that um, that makes it newsworthy. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, in the case of other subjects, it's similar. There's a new book coming out, or there's someone is uh, is a, a person who's very much in the news, or is about to be very much in the news, even better. And so you you do it ahead of time. Um, and and occasionally there's something timeless, but it's even the timeless subjects just feel like they're having their moment. So it's 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 a function of timeliness, I think, that subjects at the magazine are. Um, sure. Yeah, um, I just was curious. I mean, you asked some also inside input in what you get to write about. I'm assuming. At this yes. Point. Oh, you you absolutely sometimes in, you're never forced to write anything. Your mm -hmm. arm is twisted sometimes, but you're never forced. <laughs> and, um, and sometimes you bring an idea, you know, you sometimes say, I really want to go do this. And sometimes an editor will say to you this, or sometimes there'll be an ideas meeting um, uh, in which a great idea comes up and you sort of go, okay. do that. It's, it's a mixture of things. And uh, what about the profile of Guao Pei? Like she's almost opposite of Ray Kawakubo, right? Yes. Um, in terms of her fashion and I don't know her person. I mean, obviously I don't know her besides I think your profile. How did you get to well, do it? Well, I, I was, of course I was, the idea that I could go to China was, mm -hmm. and, and, um, um, and, and, and sort of do that reporting there was greatly tempting. I thought her work was interesting. I thought it was really super theatrical. I think she's, I think Guo Pei is at, at heart. She, she's a businesswoman. So she makes a lot of money doing these very high end, basically couture uh, clothes for her, her rich uh, mm -hmm. Chinese clients. And, but she wanted to have a, be part of the, the haute couture and she opened a shop in Paris and she did all that, that was necessary. But sure. he, I think in Guo Pei's heart of hearts, she's a customer. She's a great customer and she does these wonderful runway shows. She, there's a bit of the show woman, the McQueenish show woman in her. Mm -hmm. uh, and and it, it interested me, her, and her life interested me, coming out of the Cultural Revolution. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, she, she sort of is the new China. So that was a that was an interesting aspect of her story. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I found that profile so really fascinating. Um, I, I think we should probably open up with question quite as soon. I see they're building up, but I wanted to also ask you a little bit more generally, what do you feel like you, how do you feel fashion is evolving? Like you, you claimed again that there is like some, at some point you said that there's like a great appetite for it now, or it's increasingly- I think totally different. I mean, I, um, fashion's changed radically with Instagram and with Twitter and, um, with the internet, it's uh, the it, so many things have so many things have changed because of these forces, which we are all you know, which, which rule our lives. I don't do social media. I'm not on it, and I don't do any of that. I'm just decided I'm going to be an old lady who reads her books and goes to bed with her hot almond milk. I'm not going to do any of those things. Um, but I I see what's going on, and and so in the olden days, meaning 2000, you know. Um, I there was a there was a there was a sort of hierarchy, fashion hierarchy. There's still a hierarchy, it's just a different one. But there was a hierarchy in which the editors of Vogue and Harper's Bazaar and Tabler were, you know, uh, they reported and they and it, it was wasn't instantaneous. You waited to for the, the, the September issues, you waited to see the how they would photograph the clothes, you waited to see editorially what they would choose. And the, there's no authority anymore. The authority, yes, of course, there's influencers. Um, and that's, they've influenced everything you know, they really have. But there's no, um, there's not so much judgment anymore. It's just, and that's, I think, in, in many ways, a great thing. Uh, all kinds of people uh, are having a say, are showing off, are, are, are um, changing the language. Yeah. So uh, it's not, it, you know, all languages, traditionally have what we call BBC English, which is the, the posh version of the language. Fashion had that too. And suddenly the languages of the provinces and the languages of, of the various professions and the languages of the various uh, communities are, are, are getting in. Well, I like that metaphor, the BBC English. Um, and just to follow 
up on that. A lot of that, com- what, when it gets to the more uh, contemporary part of the book, many pieces talk about this increased speed of fashion, right? And now that's also um, making it harder for, not only for the designer, but for people reporting on it. Um, and you're not like a straight up reporter, you don't cover the fashion show, but do did, did you feel that is a tension for you as you know, well? I- I, I can't do it anymore. I'm too, not that age, it's not my age. It's just that because I, I really do shun social media, I'm no longer competent to do it. I, I, you can't do it not if you're not following social media very avidly. So I kind of don't want to at this point, although I, I, I completely see the point. I completely, it's interesting, but it's, it's something that, um, that technologically and in terms of my time, my time in front of a screen or in front of a phone, I, I have... I don't know. I, I have an iPhone, but I don't use it. I have a, my, a, I have a BlackBerry, so I can't report on fashion. You know, it's sort of I can't report on what's going on in the world in the same way that I used to before, sure. before uh, all of that stuff. And it doesn't bother me. I think it's um, it is really another world. There is still designers. There is still trends. There is still uh, events that I can write about, and you know, and and will. But in terms of the way that I would kind of write about the collection. In the beginning, I did. I went to Paris, I went to Milan, I went to the shows in New York, and that's over. And I also think that those shows are over because especially after this year of everybody sitting home and being on Zoom, Hmm. uh, the idea of the entire fashion troupe, the court, trudging from one place to another twice a year or three times a year, it's, it's, um, you know, it uses too much carbon it's it's too much carbon did you enjoy covering the collections when you did oh my god oh everyone said oh poor you you have to go to Paris but the truth is it's like going back to high school and being in the cafeteria with you know everybody it's it's you're not on the list what's your name again and then and all of this jockeying for for this and the 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 preening and the jockeying and the no, it was like high school. I, 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 I didn't like that part of it. I, I loved, you know, I had a few friends whom I would look for at the shows and, uh, and it's exhausting. So you go back to your hotel room and you eat the peanuts in the mini bar. That's sort of fashion week. Um, but uh, no, I didn't really, I, I, it's, it's the kind of thing you want to do once, maybe twice, but right. I, I don't know how people do it. I don't know how people just do this twice a year. Yeah, and the New Yorker doesn't report on collections anymore. Oh, I don't think. Like no, they did when Polly Brubach, Kennedy Fraser did these long reports in the collection, and yeah. you did it at the beginning, but now they have. No, it's it's absurd. I mean, it doesn't. And it's not absurd. I mean, it's interesting to read about it but when other people go and do it, but I don't think it's something that you know the New Yorker, also, which sometimes it does have still on and off the avenue. They would have these fashion uh, Christmas and you know some holiday things at a shopping column and now that's become ironic there are occasionally is a shopping column patty marks is like the great oh yes of course shopping yeah. column means. uh but it's not the regular feature that it used to be so yeah. that has also kind of gone by the way oh yeah yeah I, I, I remember reading those both of course the ironic contemporary one but the historical one yes yeah uh, louise long which was the first fashion critic for the new york and she she started with the New York, and she started in 1925, did all this shopping column quite regularly. Um, so it was fascinating. Yeah. I want to give um, a chance to the audience. I see so sure. many questions building up to jump in. Um, and I will start by, I guess, well, there's so many. Um, So, Francesca, I'm just going to interject yeah. and say I'm here if you need help. <laughs> there is uh, so many interesting questions. I don't know where to start. Um, Christina Lokotetis asks if there is a meaningful way to look at fashion as art. Or does that diminish the unique role that fashion plays in our culture? 
Is there a way to look at, at fashion? Fashion as well? art, or does that diminish the role that fashion so, plays? You know, I, I like to take the, the Asian approach to this. I mean, my son has lived in Vietnam for, for half of his adult life, and he's completely fluent in Vietnamese, and I like to spend time there. And, 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 and I've written about several things about Japan, apart from the Ray Kawakubo piece. They don't make a distinction between the fine and the applied arts. Sure. And I think that that's an important, we, the West does, the quote West does. Mm -hmm. um, but, but I think fashion is an applied art. And, you know, to take down, taking down the boundaries, Alexander McQueen, great artist. Uh, and uh, so I think if you look at it as, as, as a spectrum of, um, of artisanship and creativity and I, you know, Iris Van Herpen, that's art. But I, I don't even want to put those labels on. Let me take them down again, having just pinned them up there. There's a, it's a continuum. And I think um, depending on the amount of commercial uh, content there is in, uh, uh, but not necessarily because sometimes something that's tremendously popular and accessible and, and radical is, 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 a form of art too. Sure. Uh, you know, the, whoever invented the t-shirt, the, the blue jean, that's, you know, that has changed the world. So yeah. um, there's, it, it's hard, it's hard to, I, I, I'm, I'm sort of in favor of not overvaluing things, but I'm in favor of seeing it as part of a continuum. Yes. It's so interesting how Japan is so leading in so many design disciplines because of this Yes, different way of categorizing. Things. Yeah, right. Uh, but um, I, there is so many questions. Okay, so right. I have to ask this one. Eugene Rabkin um, asked Judith, was there a subject you wanted to interview and did not get access to? Was there a subject that I wanted to do and did not get access to? Let me think. Um, no, actually, I, I, it was the magazine, it's not me. They actually, uh, yeah. you know, I, I really think the New Yorker. Yeah, uh, I guess it has that power, yeah. I think it has that power. So no, I, I, I one of the great moments though was I, I went to Paris and to cover Yves Saint Laurent's last show. And my hope of getting in even with, you know, it was a mob scene, but, but um, I, I did, um, and it, it happened like a, a colleague had an invitation with a place in the front row and, and I took it, <laughs> it was. So there were these sort of extraordinary moments of uh, a privilege in the course of, of doing this. I didn't always get to sit in front. Sometimes they would give me a terrible seat. They never heard of the New York when they didn't care or, you know, so, but that, that was part of it. That was also part of it. Sure. Um, and then this question, oh, there's so many. Oh, Valerie Steele asks, so when you, when you review an exhibition of fashion, what makes it good to you? Like, you obviously have well, a choice. Valerie Steele is one of the great fashion curators. Hello, Valerie, if you're out there, she seemed to be. Uh, she, I have loved her shows and I have reviewed a, a number of them. Because Valerie Steele is always, to me, what's so important is, as with any other show, great show is the social history and and that's one thing that really makes a tremendous difference and that you you see it um you know it, it's you put the clothes in the social history you put them in the context of the life of the designer of the life of the women or men or whoever mm -hmm. individuals who wore them the life of the artisans who made them uh, the economics and the politics of the time. And that's certainly what Valerie Steele has done. And that's what I'm looking for in a show. And I'm often disappointed when, not often, I have been disappointed when um, there's no sense of the social context. Uh, that, yeah. that is something that, that has disappointed me. Yeah. Thanks. I mean, it's so much harder to do like a fashion exhibition that can be imagined, I think. Um, okay, so I have so many questions, but now I'm looking at it from the bottom up. So thank you for Laura Gardner writes, 
Thank you for a really interesting discussion. A question for both of you. Where do you see fashion writing as being critical or functioning as criticism? Where do you and see? You see, and do you see new approaches to fashion criticism and polemical writing opening up today? Um, sure, if I fully understand this question, I think. Uh, do you, Judith? I'm not sure. To, how do we see fashion writing as being critical? So I think she's oh, asking criticize Laura's criticize. asking whether it is critical. So that's a good question. It's. It, so what make, I think the question really is what makes design good? You know, what makes something special? What, what, how do you, you know, if you're judging a book, it's either, it could be a mediocre novel, it could be a great biography, it could be a, a mysterious, obscure poem, it could be whatever, you know, whatever the nature you, as a critic, you're trying to understand its nature. And so I think with fashion, and this is hard, you're trying to understand what makes it original if it is, what makes it, um, unoriginal if it's if it if it's that I think that I think that's sort of the, the critical role right to um, is to make distinctions yeah and it's interesting re researching the book a lot of time the um, criticism that was um, the way fashion criticism was criticized was that it was too close or fashion writing really that it was too close to industry so it wasn't it didn't have that critical distance um, where there is some truth to it, of course, when it comes to more um, the fashion magazine, but at the same time, there is a I mean, history of fashion criticism in general, interest publication that has that distance. So um, that wasn't really true. I mean, the books does include some pieces from fashion magazines, but the vast majority, because of that reason, is from um, you know so many different really magazines that are not exclusively or primarily a fashion magazine, The New Yorker. Um, right. so one, one important point to make here is that mm -hmm. all of the fashion critics who, who are in the book, whom I know, we all write for um, publications in which it's ethically forbidden to take any swag or to take any gifts sure. or to have any. Mm -hmm. And so that's very important because I think that's also that, that that it's you know because the fashion business you get gifts and you get this and they send you here and they and if they don't like your work they they bar you from the show so it's mm -hmm. not exactly uh, it's not you know it's not like other uh, realms of criticism in that respect there's I think one one thing that's very important is a very high standard of ethical detachment from your subject which means no free clothes. Yeah, and of course it is quite, you wouldn't be banned from like a Broadway preview. I mean, no. now, despite theater criticism being very, can be very harsh. So it's interesting, even like as early as, you know, the O's, Kathy Horn was banned from fashion show, which is in, of course, insane because you can view them online, so she could still review it. But it was kind of symbolic at that point. Yeah, but it was a power yeah. play. It was a power play. Yeah, that's so interesting. Um, but um, do you always felt like you wanted to keep a distance from fashion, Judith? So were you? Did you ever feel yourself as being one a fashion person? For only when I had to pack my bags to go to the shows, and I had to. Think of what I was going to wear, which is you know sort of a nightmare. I would lie, I would make the outfits and lie them out on the lay them on the bed and, and try to you know so that I would look cool. Uh, <laughs> that you yeah. know what to wear to cover the shows. That was hard. Uh, and I don't no, I'm really not a fashion person. I my I I um I'm not cool. You know I just I failed <laughs> failed to be cool. Um okay. And going back to the beginning. So the days of extravagant fashion show and celebrity worship is on the wane. I'm not sure if that's true, but besides the street. Where do you, besides, you know, the streetwear, where do you see fashion innovation happening these days? 
Well, I think I think we're we're seeing it happen. Um, we're seeing the globalization of, of talent. Yeah. Uh, I really think um, that's what you mean about languages. I think we're seeing uh, a lot of new languages inflected in, in entering into the conversation. And that's great. Uh, I think um, I think that the uh, fashion is becoming much more non-binary, which yeah. is also really interesting. I think, I think, you know, I, there's an extraordinary loosening up of the old gender boundaries. And of course, you remember the days when it was shocking to see a man in a skirt? Well, it's not anymore. Uh, well, maybe in some places it still is. And some places it's dangerous, of course, yes. for that person. But um, so, but it's, it's, that's a spearhead. It's, it's uh, again, because don't forget, clothes have been used to enforce gender roles. They are. They have been the single most, uh, in some ways, repressive. Not the exact word, but stringent sure enforcement does. of gender roles is how is is what you wear, how you appear. And when I was writing the biography of Colette in you know the, the in the Belle Epoque in Paris, uh, women in men's clothes were banned if you would be arrested. And if you had some reason to wear trousers, I mean, we're talking about pants. We're not talking about, if you had some professional reason to wear pants, let's say you were a mountain climber or you were uh, something else like that, then you could apply to the police for special dispensation. And that's a that's hundred years ago. That's not very far. Yeah, it's fairly. Yes. So, so one thing that I see happening is that, uh, the the do's and don'ts remember the do's and don'ts of fashion yeah the do's and don'ts there that we need another word you know do you know <laughs> meaning what you <laughs> so i think yeah. that they're really they're really going away so i think this also answers lilia ziamu question of what's interesting in fashion today i think lilia we might have answered your question already uh but yeah it's definitely this well, also what's very interesting is the use of of of, uh, of of high tech fabric, the innovations, the technical innovations, laser cutting fabric, uh, you know, uh, fabric that is that is not just organic, that is a lot, you know, alive. There's uh, God, I can't think of her name now. Um, there's some really interesting work being done with growing. Yeah. Uh, biofabrication, right? Biofabrication. Yeah. That's all yeah. really fascinating and. And I think that getting fashion into fashion is a terrible, um, has been historically uh, in terms of uh, ecology has been a terrible polluter. Sure. And I think that the green, the green revolution in fashion is very important. That's all of those innovations super important. Yeah, and you've wrote some beautiful pieces also on um, textile tradition in Japan and these, if I'm not mistaken, which kind of spoke about sustainability in some ways. Um, but it, it relates to the notion of lost languages. Again, I keep going because I write about language. It's my, one of my, my passion probably if I had to pick one. So I wrote a long a piece about lost languages. And then when I think you just mentioned Japan, the indigo dyeing, all of these artisanal techniques, which are in, in ways very much like endangered languages and the preservation of those techniques, which people are now really very aware of the way they are with the languages and everything that they teach us about the environment and the relation of which herb and which this and which color and which moth and which insect. So again, there's, uh, there's a lot of conservation that's going on and a lot of research into uh, before these things are obliterated. Sure, yeah, um, it's almost like a dialect that's yeah. in peril. But um, we really just have time for Maybe one more question. Perhaps this leads us to the Mili Ephraim is talking about the conglomerates. So the, the other, you, I think she's making reference to the idea that you spoke about authority and fashion being taken down. Uh, but she's saying, what about LVMH and the conglomerates? Don't they, um, aren't they still a kind of authority in the way we consume fashion? Absolutely. I mean, the, the, 
I guess what we have to make a big distinction between the economics of fashion mm -hmm. and the diversity of the people participating in the conversation. Now, there are moderators to this conversation, and these are these huge luxury conglomerates, which um, have have a lot of control of the market. Not total, and not uh, you know, it's not a monopoly by any by any means. But sure, there's no utopia. There's I don't think any place in any sphere you're not going to find any perfection. There's always going to be um, uh, inequality. There's always going to be uh, a, a imbalance of power. And so, I, I, yeah, I think those two things do coexist, though, the democratization and then the concentration of economic power. Yeah, because in an odd way, then there's more conglomerates now than there were, yes. you know, 30 years ago. Yes, the, the, the old, you know, the independent houses. I mean, Chanel had backers, but Balenciaga had, um, uh, they were independent. They, they, were, they were there, you know, they, they had people supporting them, but not, they weren't part, they weren't cogs in a big wheel. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so yeah, that ties on also with the idea that we were talking earlier about the temporality of fashion of speeding up this production and consumption also for even um, high-end fashion, the big designer always constantly change. I wonder how you do a profile now, like, I guess you'd have to be sure the person stayed at the house long enough. Well, one thing I really want to stress to everybody listening is that if we, if everyone is conscious about the exploitation of the people, most of them women, in um, in developing countries who make the clothes, uh, and try to exert as much uh, pressure with our buying and our our uh, support uh, to to the the project of, of making sure that their working conditions are improved, that's that's a gigantic that's a gigantic thing that I think about a lot uh yeah and, and it's it's yeah it's a. Uh, there's been a lot of slavery there's been a lot of death there's that huge bangladeshi factory that, that sure. so um just mindfulness about what we wear and where it comes from i think would be great yeah and that's another area where fashion criticism of course is quite important um, but um, I wanted to wrap up. I know we're running out of time. Um, uh, I thank you so much, Judith, for participating with me. As I said before, your work was so central to me developing the book. This book, you, I interviewed you back in 2000, a long time ago, 2013, maybe for my for fashion projects on fashion criticism. And I've followed your work ever since. You came to my classes. So it's so great to have you here um it's a culmination of my efforts and um yeah i don't really I have say i'm yeah. so proud to be in your book i've loved our conversations they really in you I, I think you're an amazing scholar and and uh writer about fashion someone who is um is is making making big changes and so and i love i love talking to you it's just a delight to turn on the zoom light and i put on makeup and dig something out of the closet and you know, hide my pajamas under the desk. You're it, calm to go, son. Yeah, we can see, <laughs> we can see some of it. Yeah, it's beautiful. Thank you. Um, and thank you everybody for attending um, and for your wonderful question. Um, I don't know if Marys, you wanna come in back for some final words? Just, yeah. this has been so wonderful and thank you to all. And please, if, if you love this conversation, which how could you not? Uh, please buy the book from us. Yeah. That would be amazing. Thank you, Paris. Thank you, everybody, for coming to yes. me dinner time. Thank you. And also thank you to Bloomsbury and Jeremy Wang Inverson for helping us put this together. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, so, yeah, thanks so much. And we hopefully we see, I see you soon one day off of Zoom. Yes, right. that would be great. Yeah. yeah. Take care, um, everybody. Bye. 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 Oh, your messages. Thanks.